Ambassador Christian College now presents the Keeslaw Commentary with Dr. Keeslaw. Hello again. I'll bet you've never proved that your church is teaching everything exactly right, have you? I bet you haven't. If you're a Baptist, if you're a Methodist, if you're if you are a Presbyterian or a Lutheran, I'll bet you've never sat down and said, I'm going to take every doctrine that I've ever heard, and I'm going to compare it to what the Bible teaches. I bet you've never done that, and don't feel too bad. Most people haven't. In fact, 99% of the people in the world have 99.99%. People have not done that. That's why Hindus grow up as Hindus, because their mama taught them to be a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Shintoist or a Taoist or believing in the Sikh religion, or the Jain religion, or J-A-I-N, the Jainist, or Zoroastrian, or whatever it might be. It's because their parents brought them up to believe that, but they didn't stop and say, no, wait a minute, do I have the right religion? Wouldn't it be great, and I'm going to talk to Christians for just a moment here. Listen to me, if you're a Christian, see if this makes sense to you. Just, just think about this. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if some young man in India is hearing this radio program. And he's a Hindu, of course. Now, there are Muslims in India, too. And it's because their parents are Muslims. But let's talk about the majority of them that are Hindu. Let's say there's a young man in India who's hearing this radio broadcast right now at this very moment. And he's thinking, well, you know, I've I've never really proved that there are a thousand different gods out there, and I've never really proved it, the doctrine of reincarnation that I'm going to come back as a cow one day if if I'm lucky. I've never really proved that. So, hmm, maybe I need to dig into this and study scientifically whether or not there really even is one God. And by the way, you can prove there is a Creator God scientifically because I've done it and I've proved it to our students year after year after year at Ambassador Christian College. We do that. We start out proving there's a God. What if that Hindu said, well, I'm going to study astrophysics, I'm going to study astronomy and cosmogony, I'm going to study these things to see if I can prove there's a God, study biology, the laws of the conservation of matter and energy, and so on. If he would do that, he would find there has to be a creator. He would know for a fact there has to be at least one who created all the universe. Now, the the Hindus already believe that, just like all of you, probably, especially if you're Christian, you already believe there's a God. Maybe you always have been a believer in God. I know a man who teaches at our college. He's one of the faculty. He used to be an atheist at one time, but he got turned around and believes in God and teaches at our college now. So an atheist can change and believe in God. But most of you have already believed in God already. Let's say that this Hindu, who also believes in in a, a higher God over all the other gods called Brahma, so he says, well, I already knew that there was a Brahma, over all these other gods, but I wonder how many gods there are. Well, he wouldn't know from just studying astronomy. He wouldn't know from studying science. So then he thinks, well, did this god leave a a, a revelation, some kind of message to mankind? Or is deism true where God started everything then and went off and left us to ourselves? Does God still pay attention to mankind? What's happening on this earth? What if that young Hindu believer began to study, first of all, his own books like the Vedas, uh, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and some of these other Hindu so-called scriptures or so-called holy books. And then he said, I'm going to study Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. He had studied that too, the, the sutras of Buddhism. And there are just thousands of their writings. And then he would start studying, of course, he'd study the Koran because there are Muslims in India. But eventually he would come around studying the Bible, wouldn't he? Do you know that some years ago a preacher took a whole bunch, hundreds of Bibles to China, and uh, there were people that were just devouring those Bibles because they didn't have anything like that in China. They couldn't, I don't mean that there aren't Bibles, there are Christians in China, but the the city where this preacher went to, they they didn't know any Christians, there were no missionaries over there, and they had never seen a Bible, but they'd heard about it. They were devouring these Bibles to learn about Jesus. Well, let's say this Hindu finally grabs hold of a Bible, and he looks into that and studies it. And he finds out that God speaks through 
what we call the Holy Bible, but God does not speak through the Bhagavad Gita. I've got a copy of it. I own a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. I own a copy of the Vedas. God doesn't speak through these so-called scriptures of other religions. You know what? You know what the Quran is? Do you know what the Vedas and, and all these other books are? They are philosophical treaties written by the philosophers of their religion where they're talking about religion and about philosophical principle. And some of it's interesting. You might even agree with some of it. And they also talk about the deity. But what is interesting, and the common denominator in the major religions of all the world's religions, the common denominator is God himself doesn't speak. God doesn't speak. Now, there may be an exception here or there, but, but, but if, if you pick up all the various scriptures you can find, God isn't speaking to mankind. The ones who are writing those holy books, so-called holy books, are writing about God. You know, we think God is like this, or we think whoever God is, he must be like that. And they don't know God. Whoever God is, they don't know him. The Apostle Paul went to Athens one day in Greece, and he saw all these statues and idols of all their Greek gods, and they had the monuments up to these Greek gods. And one of them was a monument that said these words, to the unknown God, in case they missed one. Because the Greeks had enough sense to realize that if there are hundreds and hundreds of gods, they could have missed one somewhere. So they set up a monument to the unknown God. And the Apostle Paul, who was Jewish, grew up in the Jewish religion, at least the Jewish uh, faith, and he's now a Christian, he said, uh, I noticed this monument you have, and the one that you ignorantly worship him, I declare to you. I'm going to tell you about the God you don't know. The same thing would be true in India with this young Hindu man who is who's just looking into to the truth, wanting to find the truth. He would eventually discover there is an unknown God that he does not know that the Hindus never told him about. He would find the God of the Bible. He would find the one who is the God of Israel. And if he read that entire Bible, he would learn about a man named Jesus, where God so loved everybody on planet Earth to the point he was willing to give up his own son for you. You know, the truth is in the Bible. Jesus said in John 17, 17, that God's word is truth. I've got a Bible right here in my lap right now. Open up. It's open here. And I, I can read it. I read it every day. If I don't read but a chapter, I read it every day. It's the truth of God. And the Bible is God's revelation to man. But I don't believe it because my mother told me it was true. Now, she did, but that's not the reason I believe it. Because she also told me that Santa Claus was true. And she told me the tooth fairy was true. And uh, there were other things that she thought was true doctrinally that turned out to be not true because I got into the Word of God, and the Word of God doesn't teach you about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy and all that nonsense. The Bible is truth. And a lot of the stuff that you and I grew up with, just like Santa Claus, is nothing more than myth. It really is. There was a TV show on some years ago. I believe I believe it was called Seventh Heaven. I think was the name of it. I, I never did, I never did watch it. But you know, the Mormons believe there are seven heavens. I guess that's where they got it from. But the Bible speaks of three: the first heaven being the atmosphere, the second heaven, heaven being the at, the uh, the outer space outside the atmosphere, the moon, the stars, so on, the expanse of the universe. That's the second heaven. The third heaven is the place where God lives. So the Bible speaks of only three heavens. But a lot of the stuff you've been taught, just not so. Let me ask you this. This is something that I'm not going to give you the answer to today, but you think about it. You know, around <clears throat> around the time of the Passover, when Christ died, somewhere around that time, sometimes the same week, uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants celebrate Easter. And they also celebrate a day called Good Friday. And they believe that Christ died on Friday and that he rose at sunrise Sunday morning. One full day and two nights later. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said, somebody asked him, show us a sign. He had done all these miracles. It, it, it made bread out of nothing, basically. Just had a little bit of bread there and made a whole bunch from that and fed uh, something like 20,000 people. He did, all these, he did all these miracles, and they said, show us a sign. So he told them there's only one sign that's going to be given to mankind, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonah. For the same t- amount of time that Jonah was in the, the whale's belly, so I, the son of man, he called himself, will be the same amount of time in the heart of the earth, in the ground, in the tomb. Now, he spoke poetically, called himself son of man. He referred to the grave as the heart of the earth. He spoke poetically. But we know that he was in the tomb and he rose the third day. So he was talking about the tomb when he was dead for three days. But was he dead for three days? Did he rise after one day and two nights? Or how long was he in the tomb? Matthew 12 and verse 40 says, Jesus is talking, it's in red letters, that he would be three days and three nights in the tomb. Now, if you believe that Christ died on Friday, and you count three days from Friday, one day from Friday is Saturday. Two days from Friday is Sunday. And, oops, where's your third day? Three days would be Monday. And yet Monday is the second day of the week, and Sunday's the first day of the week. And yet we see that on the first day of the week, when the women came to the tomb, the tomb was already empty. I will share one thing with you. I will tell you one thing, that you don't have to work on it and figure it out for yourself. Jesus did not rise Sunday morning sunrise, because in John chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, when the women came to the tomb to embalm his body, they didn't know he'd been resurrected. But when they came there, it was still dark. Chapter 20 and verse 1 of of the Gospel of John, when the women came to the tomb, the sun had not risen yet, and the tomb was already empty, and it was still dark. Did he rise in the middle of the night? Did he rise Saturday night? Did he rise the day before? There was nobody around to report it? If they had waited till Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, they'd have found the tomb empty. But when did he rise from the dead? It was not sunrise because they got there before sunrise. Just something for you to think about. Three. How do you get three days? Here's my question. You think about it. How do you get three days and three nights from Friday sunset, not from the time he actually died, for, but from the time he was in the tomb until the time he rose? How do you get three days and three nights from Friday evening sundown to Sunday morning? You go figure that out. Let me know how you figure that out. Some people say, well, that's a Greek idiom. It's only peculiar to the Greek language. Really? Well, Jesus said as as Jonah was a a certain amount of time, that's the same amount of time he'd be in the tomb. Go back and read Jonah chapter 1. The last verse of Jonah chapter 1, as I remember, I believe it's the very last verse, tells you how many days and nights he was in the belly of that fish. That's how many days and nights Jesus was in the tomb. And see if you can figure out how you get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. Now, am I picking on churches? No, of course not. No, 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 no. Am I picking on individual preachers? No, no, I haven't mentioned any names. I'm saying that we heard this from our parents, and they heard it from their parents, and, of course, the preachers grow up, and, I mean, I mean, look at all the, the men who are in the pulpits. They grew up in a church that taught them this. They don't question it. They go and preach in a pulpit and preach the same thing the grandma taught them. It's about time we go to the Bible to find out what it really, actually says. And a lot of the stuff we've been taught, folks, is just not so. Did Jesus have long hair or did he have short hair? I've got an article I'll send you. It's called The Real Jesus of the New Testament, Proof of the Real Jesus. It's Lesson 6. Just say, send me the one of the real Jesus, and I'll know what you mean. And we'll send you that lesson, Lesson 6, that even has an article. There's a couple of articles in there, and one of them is, did Jesus have long hair? And I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. No, he had short hair. Well, where do you get that from? The Scripture, which most people don't take the time to read. Now, it won't cost you a dime. There's no request for money. It's free of charge. And here's the telephone number. If you'll call me, if you get an answering machine, spell out your street address, and um, 
make sure we have your zip code. Here's the number to call, 704-938-6415. That's 704-938-6415. It's free of charge. Just ask for the one on the real Jesus. Until next time, this is Keith Slough. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Dr. Keith Slough from Ambassador Christian College. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for the Keith Slough Commentary on 1140 WRNA, 1460 WRKB, and FordBroadcasting.com.